Travel can be many things. It's a way to take a break, see new places, visit friends and family, or even celebrate occasions like a birthday or honeymoon. Travel is also about creating memories. And one way we commemorate the places and experiences that travel takes us is through the objects we pack into our often overstuffed bags to bring home. When we think about souvenirs, we might picture something like a gladiator apron from Rome, a royal tea towel from the UK, or a shot glass from Jamaica. But travel keepsakes actually come in all shapes, forms, and budgets. They sometimes carry with them a much deeper meaning than meets the eye. So today, we're unpacking the history, the purpose, and the symbolism of souvenirs. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Traveling with Triple A. I am so excited to introduce you to a writer, a traveler, and a friend I actually met at the White House a few years ago. And we decided we wanted to drop that fun fact that that's where we met, because how cool is that, that we met at the White House? This was 2014. And so before social media really leaned in, and so blogging was a big deal. And I think it was under the Obama administration, they were trying to promote one of their study abroad programs. And they thought, well, media is different now. And maybe if we invite these bloggers, they can get people excited about study abroad programs. It was really smart. But of course, you and I both just love the fact that we got to go to the White House and hang out and get our pictures taken and, and feel a little bit important as travel media people, which doesn't happen all the time. But it's cool to, cool to see you and talk to you again. Yes. And do you know that I actually have a souvenir from that? And it is a little container of Barack Obama branded M&M. Hershey Kisses. I got the Hershey Kisses and I still have them. They're in my jewelry box. I'm not going to eat them, but I, that's my souvenir from our day at the White House. I swear to you, Angie, my, my M&Ms are hanging <laughs> up on my office wall. A Kansas spoon and like a $2 bill from my, the first time I went to a, a drive-in movie with my wife. And I have my White House Obama <laughs> M&Ms hanging on my wall. So that's, it ties, how, how we met for the first time ties right into Perfect. our theme. Yeah, that's hilarious. We are going to talk today about souvenirs, where they come from, why people get them. This is because you just wrote a book, right? Called Souvenir. Yeah, it actually came out in 2018. Souvenir is part of Bloomsbury's Object Lesson series about the hidden lives of ordinary objects. And as a traveler, what object better to uh, write a book about than souvenirs, which sometimes considered a fallen object sort of kitsch. But I think that they're so central to not just the way we travel now, but travelers have always had an interesting relationship with objects and with travel souvenirs. What is the general purpose of a souvenir? A souvenir in French is a verb, which means to remember or to take myself back to myself. Whereas in English, uh, since the late 18th century, it's been used to describe objects that are used to remember. And this, this goes all the way back to uh, ancient pilgrimages and beyond, that travelers sort of live in an ephemeral world that's very distant and far from where they live. And so these souvenirs help them create a story to themselves and to their friends and family about where they've been, what they've done, and how far the journey has taken them. How have souvenirs evolved through the ages from, let's say, beads and, and spices, maybe fabric? Travel used to be a thing that like merchants and soldiers traders and rich people did. Years ago, souvenirs, they weren't industrialized. And in fact, in my, in my book, Souvenir, I write about how Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, when they went to Stratford-upon-Avon in the late 18th century, they went to Shakespeare's house and they took out a knife and they carved off bits of his chair. It was so common for rich people to just sort of do whatever they wanted with souvenirs that this weird, basically defacing the chair of Shakespeare was just sort of seen as a tourist tradition. But this was at a time when only rich usually white men traveled. Once travel became industrialized, once the middle-class hoi polloi went there, you couldn't have everybody going to Shakespeare's house carving his chair up, right? You also got the abstraction of souvenirs. Whereas when rich people went to Milan, they would get Milanese crystal that their friends knew was Milanese crystal because they were also rich. Well, when middle-class travelers went there, they would get a plate that said Milan <laughs> because they didn't have that same education and cultural level. And so once it shifted to this tourist industry where you had plates with the name of a place on it. It became industrialized, right? And so in the 19th century, it was actually Germans made all of the knickknacks, all of the thimbles and all of the souvenir spoons were in Germany. Well, now it's China. And in fact, in, in research for my book, I went to a, a trade fair, a souvenir trade fair in Las Vegas. And it was so interesting. Like people would come from the national parks and gift shops all over the United States 
they would meet with uh, souvenir vendors and the vendors would send off their orders to China. Like without exception, everybody had suppliers in China because China can make a lot of product for a very inexpensive price. And so these days, if you go to Egypt, if you go to South America, if you go to different parts of Europe, odds are there's probably a 70% chance that souvenir you buy is gonna be made in China, especially if it's one of those small sort of shot glass refrigerator magnet type souvenirs. That's so interesting to think about that the souvenirs we often pick up are only souvenirs because they have the name of the place stamped on them, but it maybe has very little to do with the actual place. So what are the alternatives to kind of these mass produced standard souvenirs? The more sophisticated you get as a traveler, the less likely you are to buy that kitsch. But I don't want to look down my nose at those kitschy souvenirs because those are probably the souvenirs we collect when we're the most excited about travel. I think that we're sort of at our purest when we're young newbie travelers, be it age 18 or age 80. Tourist scholars, they, they categorize different types of souvenirs that people pick up. And one is just called Piece of the Rock. And basically Piece of the Rock is something that you pick up while you're there. So say you're in Paris and you have a beautiful night and you drink this delicious bottle of Cote d'Iron wine on the banks of the Seine. Well, you keep that bottle and you put it in your home, right? That's a piece of the rock. It's not from a souvenir market, but it's just, it's a local product that contributed to a beautiful night. And so you keep that. I think that's probably the purest kind of souvenir collection, regardless of what you pick up at a store. It's that little rock on the beach where you saw the sunset after staying up all night with these best friends who you didn't know two days before. It's saving a little bit, maybe a, a ticket stub from an opera that you saw in Rome uh, and you've never been to an opera before. It's those little things that are sort of unique to the experience. And they used to have these scrapbooks. Now we put everything on Instagram, right? But you had a scrapbook where you, you would keep a ticket or you would keep a little memento of the experience. Those aren't commercial souvenirs, but they're very pure souvenirs. The best alternative is just to find something that's meaningful to you that is just sort of an ephemera of an experience and you can keep that. And maybe when people walk into your house, they don't really know what it is, but you can look at it and think, yeah, that's, that reminds me of this place from a distant place. Uh, and it makes me happy to think about it. Now I think about what I buy for other people and that's a whole different kind of souvenir. Is it different when you buy stuff for other people? It is because that is a manifestation of a relationship that you're trying to honor the Japanese have this tradition called omiyage, where you actually, the only souvenirs you buy are the ones for other people. Basically, there's sort of this ritual, and pardon me if, if you're Japanese and I don't quite paraphrase this the right way, but basically, when you leave your home community, you sort of owe your neighbors and friends and family a debt for not being in their lives for a while. So you buy them things, you buy them souvenirs, they call them omiyage, that is sort of an offering to that relationship. That's sort of the two halves. There are these souvenirs that we keep for ourselves, that are in a way very much museums of the personal. We can collect these ob objects that only we know what they mean. But then there's these other things where you, you bring back gifts for other people to honor those relationships. And to this day, my dad just turned 85 years old and I still remember the sorts of things he would bring me back. He was a science teacher. From these field trips he would take to places like Western Kansas or Arizona, that made me feel good as a kid. That I think it was, it really made me feel honored and loved when my dad brought me home like a little stone statue of a tiger that he bought in a gift shop. Do you have a certain group of people that you always buy for, Angie? Pretty much anybody who's watching my dogs. So, you know, my siblings, my parents, they always get some kind of snack. It's usually food related because I love to bring a taste home to people of whatever it is that we ate that we loved. Count me in to bring the chocolate, the macadamia nuts, Whatever I can get away with bringing back, I like to bring the food. I married a foodie too. She's not only have gifts as a love language, but food is a love language. And so it's so funny what a percentage of our luggage this summer was uh, given over to food. I guess the cliche is that you're, you're really giving gifts to show off where you've been. But in fact, what will maximize the happiness and pleasure of the person I'm giving this to? What is the best souvenir anybody's ever brought you? There was a t-shirt. And it just said Paris that my sister gave me from her junior, from your, like her high school junior trip to Europe. It was one of those like 10 cities in 14 days sort of trips. And the shirt must've cost like two bucks because it fell apart. But I was so thrilled that she had thought of me and brought that home for me. And it sort of made that place seem real to me, you know, that she had gone to this place and maybe someday I would go to that place too. And so I think that underscores the fact that it doesn't have to be an expensive or rare or hyper authentic souvenir that, that gets people excited, that basically she, she's a couple years older than me. So when she brought me back this super cheap Paris shirt that fell apart, 
I was so excited to have it because it meant that maybe someday I would go there too. I still remember that one as a special one. That's so sweet. My sister and I have a very similar thing. She was 12 years younger than me. So when I first went to Paris, she was little, she was itty bitty. And I, I brought her a children's book in French. And I wrote in the front that someday we would travel the world together. And we did. We actually did. When she grew up, we went into business as world travelers together. So it's it's fun how those souvenirs can carry with you and plant dreams in your little heart that you didn't know you had. And now the AAA Travel Minute. Renting a car overseas can give you the freedom to really roam. And with a little planning, it's a breeze. To secure better rates and a good selection of vehicles, start by booking well in advance. Next, apply for an international driving permit. It's a card that translates your license information into 10 languages. Many countries require you to carry it alongside your regular license. Even where it's not mandated, the permit is handy if you get pulled over. You can apply for one at your local AAA branch. Of course, you'll need to familiarize yourself with local driving laws. Some road signs, like the stop sign, are the same everywhere, while other signs and rules vary. Get started with the U.S. State Department's online guide called Driving and Road Safety Abroad. Remember that you'll need insurance that's valid in the country you're driving in. Consider purchasing it directly from the rental agency, but also keep in mind that some travel insurance providers offer policies. Finally, on pickup day, inspect the car and document any scratches or dents, then buckle up and hit the road. This has been the AAA Travel Minute. What do you think about photos as souvenirs? It's easy to forget that in our lifetime, photos have gone from objects to data on a screen. There was a time when the camera was invented in the 19th century that only technicians could make photos. The cameras were so slow that if you took a family picture, you had to stand still for like two minutes or else it would be blurry. Well, then in the early 20th century, they had the, the Kodak Brownie. It was a point-and-shoot camera, which changed the ritual of tourism. And that was sort of hand-in-hand -hand with, with postcards. Like, postcards were the Instagram of the early 1900s and the late 1800s. There was a craze for those things. that They sold in the billions every year because it was just so exciting. They weren't used to that. Well, now, not only are postcards sort of on the wane, but physically printed photos are on the wane, too. But they absolutely are souvenirs. Even if we post them to Instagram or share them on our phones or text them to our mom, they are very much souvenirs of the place we be and, and of we're going to. And one thing I try to encourage people who are taking photos is to try and be real insofar it's possible. Because there's a certain idealized picture of you in front of the Eiffel Tower or the Giza Pyramids. But in that picture of you with like the Pizza Hut next to the Giza Pyramids, like anything that you can show like what year or what idiosyncrasies are happening. I think oftentimes when we take photos, we try to take a photo of the trip we wish we were taking instead of the trip that we are taking. And so one way that photos can become even more a souvenir is to sort of let go of that perfect National Geographic Instagram photo and just take a picture that really speaks to the moment that you were in it. Cheesy Old West photo shoots, which I love. Are those souvenirs? Do those count? Like you sit down and you put on a cowboy hat and, and a lasso and you pose for a tintype. Is that what that is? You get costumes to choose from and, and you can go full like rifle and empty whiskey bottle and be like a saloon girl or you can be a cowboy, whatever. A lot of super touristy towns, I would say like downtown St. Augustine, they have their Old West photos. And so it's just a fun and ridiculous thing to do. Yeah, in, in Silver Dollar City in Branson, Missouri, when I was like 12, we took a family picture. Uh, they, they, were like, they were like a Civil War family. The father and the son were you know, marching off to war. So it looked very somber. It was so fun and it was ridiculous. But that's something that I haven't literally touched on in this conversation is that souvenirs are really part of the imagination that comes with travel. You can really feed your imagination in so many ways, either being a make-believe Civil War soldier or a cowboy or a cowgirl, or going and getting a Game of Thrones souvenir in, in, in Croatia or a Lord of the Rings souvenir in, in New Zealand. Travel exists before we even go places in our imaginations. And so as we collect our souvenirs, it really honors our imagination as much as it does the places we go to. What are some of the most unique souvenirs that you've come across in your research? If you study the old pilgrimage traditions, Christian pilgrims brought back all kinds of stuff, including like entire dead bodies, you know, like this is the leg of St. Stephen. And then they would give it to a church, right? So I think the relationship 
between sacred objects from a pilgrimage and souvenirs is closer than you might think. This was back when you not only couldn't fly, you could barely even sail to these places. You had to walk at risk of your own life for months to reach Jerusalem or to reach Mecca or other pilgrimage locations. And so when you brought things back, it was a big deal. Plus, fact checking was a little was a little looser, you know. Like, so you, if you brought back a piece of the, the true cross, it's like, well, they said it was a piece of the true cross. Mark Twain, when he wrote *The Innocents Abroad* uh, in the in 18th century, he joked that there were so many pieces of the true cross that they could have had a, a whole forest of true crosses because everybody seemed to have a bit of the true cross. And so I think what might sound weird, including Thomas Jefferson carving off a piece of a Shakespeare chair are just, it's part of this veneration economy that even after Christian pilgrimage was on the wane, they would find something from Shakespeare, you know, sort of these enlightenment ideals of, the, of genius. And people would take locks of hair from Milton and other great scholars. And so by comparison, shot glasses and collector spoons are pretty tame compared to what people used to bring back. So short of stealing dead body parts and defacing vintage furniture, what advice do you have for us about choosing ethical, meaningful souvenirs? If you can find a way to contribute to the local economy with your souvenirs, even better. When I was in Mozambique, a lot of people on the roadside would sell piri piri sauce, which is sort of a, a combination of a Portuguese hot sauce with African flavors, you know. And how great would that be if you can get it through customs to get some piri piri sauce that somebody made a couple bucks to send their kid to uh, prep school, you know? Anytime you can find like the craftsman who made that little artwork, person who painted that picture or made or carved that little figurine, if you can pay them directly and not have a middleman, then that's, that's even better because you're really, you're doing something that we talk about a lot as tourists, but we do less than we should, which is giving money directly back. And I'm not talking about like giving money to a charity, but like honoring somebody's genius as a painter or a sculptor or a, or a chef or a maker of hot sauce and just saying, this is delicious, can I buy some? This is amazing, can I buy some? And that is really fun. And I think that really rewards traveling slowly. I think sometimes when we're in a sprint to go through a place and we end up just buying stuff at the airport. Not to knock that, I've done it myself. But at the end of the day, if you can slow down enough to get that handcrafted item that's really special for the, your friends back home, but also is gonna make a financial difference in the person who made that, then that's a great ethical way to collect souvenirs. What should travelers consider when it comes to traveling with souvenirs, thinking about leaving room in your suitcase, packing things safely, and then restrictions? Because you cannot bring everything you might want to bring back home. My primary bit of advice is pretty simple, and that's you might save the souvenir ritual till the end of the trip. I've seen so many travelers and I've been one of them. Immediately, you're like shopping for souvenirs on day one. And it's like, do you really want to carry all those souvenirs around for your whole trip? say you take a two week trip, the advantage of waiting at the end of those two weeks is you're just gonna know the culture better. You're gonna know the prices better. You're gonna be better at bargaining. You're gonna know how authentic it is because oftentimes that really cool mask that you see on day one, by day 10, you've seen a million like it because it's mass produced and you're not in a position to meet the craftsperson because they might not live in the country. And so that just allows you to sort of create an emotional or an intimate relationship with the place you're traveling before you go off shopping for something. And one thing that you can do, and we did it this summer, my wife and me, is that we bought an extra suitcase. At the end of the trip, it's like, yeah, okay, we're, we have three days left. We're gonna get all those souvenirs we thought we were gonna get. They're not gonna fit, but we're just gonna check an extra baggage and we'll just figure in our souvenir budget an extra $75 to pack an extra bag. And that worked out quite well. When I was in Kenya, I did my whole trip and then I bought hand carved animals of the animals that I had seen on safari. So I had sort of that little connection. I, I got them from the artisan that was local, but it was also, I saw those and I remember that. And so that was kind of special. Yeah, I think sometimes the souvenirs we buy, especially when we're younger, are there souvenirs of what we expected. But then when you, when you have a more nuanced experience of a place, then you're really getting souvenirs of what you experienced to your animals in, in Kenya versus what you thought you might experience. In my souvenir book, I, I write about how I, I just obsessively collected masks when I first traveled in Asia. Not because I really went to mask performances, but because I had friends who collected masks and it made it feel real. It's like, yeah, it's happening. 
and this mask is from here, and this mask is here, and this mask is from here. And if anybody had said, oh, well, what, what kind of performance is this mask used for? It would be like, I have no idea. I don't even know the name. It just sort of looks cool, right? And so that those, those were souvenirs of my expectations and my excitement at traveling rather than where I actually was. So again, after you see the animal, well, then buy the figurine. After you taste the hot sauce, then ask if they have a bottle of it. And that just, and again, not to knock the souvenirs we collect when we're younger, but that just is more meaningful over the long term to really have a more nuanced relationship with that thing that you bring home. Souvenirs, in a sense, even if they're silly shot glasses or teaspoons, are sacred objects. They really are a part of that old pilgrimage tradition where people went to a distant place and this thing had a special energy because it was from a distant place. I think that's something that we can continue to honor because those, those are part of the tapestry of your life. These little objects that help tell stories about where we've been and who the important people we are in our lives, then that's a really, that underscores the fact that even tacky looking souvenirs can be sacred objects. Rolf Potts, thank you for joining us. And thank you to our listeners for being with us. If you're planning a trip, be sure to connect with a AAA travel advisor. Check out AAA.com forward slash travel or visit your local branch. This podcast is a production of Auto Club Enterprises. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and leave us a review. I'm Angie Orth. Thank you for traveling with AAA.